And welcome to the One Shot Podcast. Had to get it in, didn't you? It felt weird <laughs> on the last episode where I brought us in, huh? Well, this will go live before that, but in a few weeks, yeah, you'll you'll uh, okay, yeah. you'll hear that Tyler and I had a little fight on who got to do the intro. So I don't know if it was a fight. It, it was a you 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 gracefully stole my thunder. you gracefully let me do it like it was out of pity for <laughs> That's sure. Right. That's right. And we're uh, we're gonna jump right into the meet of today because uh, as it turns out, Tyler and I have full time jobs, and yeah. uh, unfortunately, we can't just piddle on the microphone all day long. So uh, we're going to get right into this. Uh, unless you had any opening thoughts, any no. BS banter? No? I've got plenty, but... Uh, <laughs> Let's save it. <laughs> nothing, save it for another day. Nothing relevant. <laughs> <laughs> so we are on part three, our conclusion. Conclusatory. Is that a word? Con yes. Conclusatory? Dude. We're on our conclusatory episode. <laughs> <laughs> Of the Think Again series, if you've been with us the last couple of weeks, uh, it's a book by Adam Grant that I highly recommend everybody pick up and, and take a read. Obviously, like all these book reviews, we don't even scratch the surface on all the good takeaways. Uh, and you may take something completely different away mm -hmm. than what we have. But uh, I do think it's, I mentioned this last week, I do think it should be uh, mandatory for all high schoolers to go through. It just gives you a good sense of... Uh, how it's appropriate to think about your ideas yeah. and doesn't mean that you're, you know, blowing in the wind and you just kind of go all over and you believe everything. It, you can still have your convictions, but it just means the foundational things that you think about having your ideas, yeah. things that you learn, being okay with being proven wrong yeah. and being open to other ideas and other perspectives. Yeah. As well. It's just, it, it, it's been an awareness of how you think like right. typically we just like react. Right. And we mm -hmm. think and want, once our thought, once our thought happens, then we don't ever question it. That's right. Naturally, right. Yeah. Well, until, a lot of times it's yeah. fully challenged. And a lot of times we surround ourselves with people that think the same way that yes. we do. So really, on a daily basis, I don't know about you, but I it's rare that unless I seek it out, it's rare that I'm challenged in my thoughts. Yes. Yeah. Because most of the people I rub elbows with on a day to day basis yeah. think like I do, yes. and that's just natural, right? Yeah. We, we gravitate to people we like. Absolutely. But what's good about this is we're in a country of. 300 and however many million Americans, you're not going to agree with That's right. even a small percentage of everybody. Mm -hmm. So it's good to get used to that muscle of yeah, know, and you know, having disagreement. I, what, what's, what I think is really cool about this is that, and, and for me even, just applying some of the things that we've learned through this book is when I do see things I don't agree with, I don't get triggered like I used to. That's, that's a great point. You know, it's yes. like, okay, hold on, let me take a step back. Let me let me just think about how I'm thinking about this. That's right. And and it's just like, okay, let's look at it from a different point of view. Now, look, there are some things that I'll come across where I'm like, yeah, I thought about it. I just don't get it. Like yeah. I, I really don't get it. But it but it at least delays that initial like emotional reaction to someone thinking differently. Because there's many times where I was like, Oh, okay, I could I, I understand where they're coming from. Um, more than mm -hmm. I did before, and I would like to look into it more. And so it's just been, man, it's been it's been great. Yeah. But to your point is, we naturally gravitate towards people that are like us. Mm -hmm. And actually, we were at uh, an event this week for a bunch of retired players, and we were just talking about the idea of community and um, just the Matt Holiday and his wife actually taught. And, uh, and, and one of the things that they said is, is, is Matt was like, don't surround yourself with yes, men, mm. people that just tell you, Oh yeah, yeah. I agree with you. Like put yourself around people that are going to challenge you, put yeah. yourself around that are going to call you out. Um, and I mean, that's, it was a different perspective, but having people that have different thoughts and ideas and backgrounds only helps you become more well-rounded. That's right. Yeah, and if you're not familiar, Adam Grant is actually a left-leaning professor at a university that you and I could never get into. I don't. Mm. I, it escapes me which one it is, but I could never get in. Probably like uh, Dart, <laughs> Dartmouth <laughs> yeah. or something like so that. So he does a good job of staying pretty neutral, but there's some ideas in here that that I disagreed with. Mm. And and that's, again, it's even just reading this book oh. is a challenge to some of your ideas and concepts. So yeah. again, just a great book overall. And week one, if you, again, if you, if you missed it, week one, uh, we talked about, he has this idea of it's three different professions, um, preacher, prosecutor, and professor. And so when we're expressing our ideas, a lot of times we default to one of those three. What he said, you actually want to gravitate towards is more like a scientist, yeah. somebody who's curious, somebody who's constantly looking to prove yourself wrong. Yeah. 
uh, and think about you again, think about new ways to think about things. Yep. Uh, so that was week one. Last week we covered a few ideas on how to approach conflict and how healthy it is for you and your kids. Yeah. Again, I think a lot of times, at least for me, I think all conflict is no good. Why would I want to, you know, get in arguments in front of my kids, actually showing them correctly how to approach an argument is a great life lesson and something I just don't think about very often. Uh, and then this week we wanted to wrap it up, uh, with covering the right way to have controversial conversations, mm. how we can rethink our education system and escaping tunnel vision in your career pursuits. We talked a few weeks ago about, you know, pursuing your passion, things like that. So he had some thoughts on that, which I thought was, which I thought was good, but let's start with controversial conversations, something that none of us ever do. Yeah. We never have controversial conversations, especially not on Twitter. No. It's always unity and it's a safe place. Togetherness. <laughs> supportive and, yeah. and encouraging. That's right. That's right. So, so number one is a little counterintuitive to what we, what we most think or m most of us think. And it's about hearing opposing opinions doesn't work. Sounds a little counterintuitive, yeah. right? Let's dive in. Yeah, let's say expand. So, yeah, so from the book. We now know that where complicated issues are concerned, seeing the opinions of the other side is not enough. Social media platforms have exposed us to, to them, but they haven't changed our minds. Hearing an opposing opinion doesn't necessarily motivate you to rethink your own stance. It makes it easier for you to stick to your guns. Psychologists have a name for this, binary bias. It's a basic human tendency to seek clarity and closure by simplifying a complex continuum into two categories. An antidote to this is proclivity to this proclivity is complexifying, showcasing the range of perspectives on a given topic. We might believe we're making progress by discussing hot button issues as two sides of the coin, but people are actually more inclined to think again if we present these topics through the many lenses of a prism. A dose of complexity can disrupt our overconfident cycles and spur rethinking cycles. It gives us more humility about our knowledge and more doubts about our opinions. And it can make us curious enough to discover information mm. we were lacking. Mm. So a little misleading there. He's not saying, you he's know, not saying, don't. he's saying, he's it, saying, don't limit yourself that's to right. black or white. His point is, let's just take, you know, a big one, abortion. Instead of saying pro-life, yeah. pro-choice. There's a wide spectrum. You're probably going to, most people you meet are probably going to fall somewhere. Maybe in certain cases, they're yeah. pro-life, certain cases, they're pro-choice, mm -hmm. right? Usually they're not just dead set one. Now yeah. you do have some people are, but again, there's a continuum of thoughts there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so that's his point is when you try to base yourself and think about what the other side and you just put them into that one little box, mm -hmm. it's not as helpful as thinking, well, maybe there's some nuance to their opinion. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. And again, we live, we live in a world that is gray. Right. There's nuances to everything. That's right. And so uh, what what I hear is, look, if it's just if you hear left stance, right stance, that's it. All you're going to do. And, and I opened up on this book is like, OK, I hear an opposing view. I try to think through a different lens. Um, but it, it brings up a good point is when we hear that. Are we really trying to understand it and accept it or are we just trying to poke holes in it? Mm hmm. Um, I like, I truly try to like, okay, hold on. Let me try to put myself in their shoes. Um, but here's where to this point, it makes it completely different. If you're pro-life, you know, or pro-abortion, it's like, okay, no pro-life it's murder. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or pro-abortion it's woman's choice, woman's body, woman's choice. If you just hear those two, it's like, well, hold on. But like, what about the nuance of, you know, a 15 year old girl mm -hmm. who was abused and you know say kidnapped and abused yep. and okay is there not a nuance there um what about uh what about a um what about a mother who has a health complication that if she continues the pregnancy she and the baby will lose their right. life right. like there's nuances right? right so if you start to see all different things you're like well okay hold on let me let me think back kind of through maybe my perspective and do any of these things resonate with me and do I connect with those? Is, is that something that I believe like from a foundation perspective that aligns with what I believe? Mm -hmm. But if you just hear black or white, it's very easy just to make sure you're on that side That's of right. the line. That's right. That's right. Uh, next segment here is consumers should demand nuance. Have you ever been uh, scrolling through whatever social media or, or just the internet in general? Mm -hmm. 
seen a headline and either gotten upset or, you know, not really thought much through it. It's just like a black and white headline and, and you, you know, clicked on it and, and started getting raged and whatever. Maybe before this yeah. book. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. Quite a bit actually. Yeah. 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 So his point is, uh, we as consumers should demand better. Yeah. So from the book, it says as consumers of information, we have a role to play in embracing a more nuanced point of view. We can favor content and sources that present many sides of an issue rather than just one or two. When we come across simplifying headlines, we can fight our tendency to accept binaries by asking what additional perspectives are missing between the extremes. Of course, a potential challenge of nuance is that there isn't seem that they don't seem to go viral. Attention spans are short. We have only a few f seconds to capture eyeballs with a catchy headline. It's true that complexity doesn't always make for good sound bites, but it does seed great conversations. Yeah, think about like this is Instagram, for example. If you see, you know how like they'll do like screenshots of text, whether it's from, you know, something else. I, I'm not sure how they do it because I've never done it. But if you've got like more than three lines to where like it takes me more than five seconds to read it, and then you look down and you got all those dots, like, mm -hmm. oh, there's more to read. Like, unless it's something that like I'm very connected to and it's someone that I respect, I'm not reading those. Right. That's yep. too much. Yeah, if it's a random account, yeah. you're probably not reading through yeah, it. Yeah, no chance, yep. right? Unless, I, unless I'm engaged somehow mm -hmm. and you engage with the clickbait, that there's no detail, no nuance, and it's going to be loud. And there's been so many articles that are written um, where the title is completely misleading, but that's all people, they don't dig into it. They don't right. dig into the details. And then here's, here's a question, though, and, and this may take more time than you want to on this, but I'm going to do it anyways. Uh, is your show. How do we, as consumers, demand it Demand details, nuance, credibility, like actual reliable sources mm -hmm. in reporting and news when news channels have to make revenue, right? They have to make money. When the consumers are only worried about Flash, are only mm -hmm. worried about it, how do you how do you now change the business model revert back to what it used to be 30 years ago when journalists actually had to have credibility to what they were reporting how do you revert back to that when the business is elsewhere yeah i mean think about they wouldn't do it first and foremost they wouldn't do it if it didn't work right so the catchy headlines you know assuming people aren't going to read too far into it it works yeah which is why they do it obviously yeah they are they are tapping into the natural human instinct of we look for threats we want quick. We don't have a lot of time. Yeah. We want the quick threat. What's the quick threat? That is, okay, I'm going to go gravitate towards that. Yeah. How can I neutralize that threat? Yeah. So one thing I do, a couple things I do, is I actually refuse to click on flashy headlines. Huh. If it's something that sounds too yeah, good to be true. But you're the minority, though. Well, like, that's... Like extreme right, minority. Right. And, that, and that's the problem is... And I think about that. Too, I'm not going to click... The thought in my head is yeah. I'm not going to click on this and give them that satisfaction. Yeah. Right, right, right. But the reality is I'm just one person who's not clicking. Yeah. So, yeah. But again, it can't, can that mentality be contagious? It could be. If, if we're all willing to have a nuanced approach, yeah. the problem is we're not, a lot of us. And this isn't even considering all the bots that are out there, right. the fake accounts. Right. The, the, so actually legitimate people, I got to think there's more than just me out there that's willing yeah. to bypass extreme articles yeah. for the sake of, I don't want to give them that pleasure. Yeah. Uh, another thing that I do is I've gone away from, not that I ever really watched the mainstream media or news anyway, but I've gone away to more independent type. Yeah. Fo like we talked Crystal and Sager, Breaking yep. Points. Yep. My true news, I get from them. Yeah. Uh, Joe Rogan, for instance, he gained, after the whole COVID controversy with him, I think he gained something like 10 million subscribers, yeah. something like that. Like crazy amount of people are flocking to him because they know he doesn't have an agenda. Yeah, they know he's gonna bring on all sides. They yep. know he's gonna talk to everybody. He's gonna have his opinions, and you may agree or disagree. Yeah, but he's gonna talk to everybody. Yeah, and he's gonna try to get to the bottom of it. Yep. There's no agenda for him. He's not being paid by these big companies. Right. I mean, he is in a way, but they're not. They're not censoring what he's saying. That's right. So to me, the flight is to more individuals who yeah. aren't controlled. Yeah, who don't have big companies and corporations putting their thumb on what they say and who yeah. care less about, you know, censorship and things like that yeah. or are too big to fail. Yeah. So true. to me, those are a couple of things that I do to mitigate. Yeah. Uh, but again, I'm just one man. I can't change a whole industry if, unless all of us start to take that mentality, which yeah. I think people, you know, are starting to, mm -hmm. 
But enough people are still clicking on these catchy headlines. So question to, to you, do you feel as if you are more prepared to have conversations in real time, real life with real people now that you're you're getting your information and news from a different type of source than that? I mean, do you feel like I do feel like I understand this a little bit better. It's an unbiased source. Yeah. You know, the, you know, yeah, I, I have I have not much to compare it to because I didn't used to be in, as into current yeah. events and mainstream news as I used to, it, it, you know, I didn't used to be like that, but yes, I feel like I can have a conversation with a wide range of topics yeah. because even the little bit I do listen to, maybe I don't listen to a whole lot, but yeah. the little bit I do, I know for sure is more than yeah. the majority of people I, yeah. I talk to. Yeah. Cause nobody's a freak of, you know, nobody's a freaking weirdo like me and listens to as much as I do. So, yeah. um, yes, to answer your question. Yes. I do yeah. feel prepared listening to these types of, of sources. Um, because, again, I think most of us are starving to get the opinion crap out of here and yeah. just tell us what happened. Yeah. Yes. Right? What yes. is the actual, what What actually happened? I don't yeah. want to hear your opinion. I don't want to hear your slant. Yeah. I don't want to hear what you think about it. Yes. I just want to know what happened. See, and I'm I'm like you. I avoid them. The difference is, is I don't go, I haven't researched and sought out independent news sources. And I haven't just, so I, I have taken the bury my head in the sand approach for the most part. Yeah. So there's times that like, I'm hearing things and I'm like, wait, what? They're like, yeah, that happened yeah. like three weeks ago. I was like, wait, what? And so I guess the question to you is, do you feel like you're missing out? Do you feel like your life is altered? Not really. So then maybe really. that's another way to answer this. Yeah, but I don't know. I don't know. Bury head in the sand. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. I, Again, we, we talked about this early, early on in the podcast and how, as people, we were designed to be in tribes, right? And we were designed to be in tribes of no more than 100-ish people. Mm -hmm. Like, that's humans. That's what we're designed. And now we've got thousands and thousands of, you know, followers and friends and, you know, our even our work community. You, you have to be friends with everybody. Like, our communities have gotten so big. And then now we're hearing international news. Or think back in the day, and I say back in the day, I mean, like, 20 years ago. Pre printing press. No, but even pre printing <laughs> oh, yeah. press. Yeah. Um, but like we were in tribes. So the only things that we knew are was information and activities that were within a proximity where it would directly affect us. Mm -hmm. Right. So if there's another tribe coming, you know, oh hey, there's people, there's people coming. Or um, you know, they're sick or they whatever it is, you know, food shortage, just stuff that directly and that's kind of that's how we've been wired as humans. And now we just have so much information. That it's like it's overwhelming, and it's like, what is it really like? I, 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 very terrible example because like, like what's going on in in Ukraine is awful, right? And and never want to see that. But has it affected your daily life? No. But has the fear, and like for like my kids still every day still pray for Ukraine every single day. Like it's kind of just become their thing. I don't know if they really like are yeah. mean anything, but. But that fear of an invasion now has affected people all over the world because mm -hmm. we're so in tune with what's going on in the events that are happening there. So is that fear a good thing or is it a bad thing? Are yeah. we allowing excess information to affect us negatively? Yeah. yeah, I feel like I've used the word paradox more than I've ever used in my life the yeah. last few yeah. months. But it is a paradox. It's the, the good of being informed and uh -huh. knowing what's going on. Yeah. The downside of being informed and knowing what's going on yeah. is this vicious paradox yeah. that we have. Yeah. Because I, I tend to think that if we were like 20, 30 years ago where our small communities yeah. were our sources of information, there's a certain happiness. That or I had to go make that. effort to go buy the New York Times right. or right. the Washington Post right. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, so, I, so I do think there's a certain happiness yeah. and joy in that that you're just exposed to a small amount of ideas and you can kind of stay in your own little lane. But then the other side, the, the positive side of being exposed to other ideas from people completely different than you. Yeah. Right. I grew up, I grew up in a small, very conservative town in mm -hmm. West Texas. Everybody seemed to, that I rubbed elbows with seemed yeah. to have the same general ideas. Yeah. Even just moving to a new community, which is out here in Dallas, Fort Worth has exposed me to other people yeah. and new ideas. And then now you ramp on top of that podcasts, news sources. So uh, there's literally no corner of the earth I can't touch in my mind. Yeah. If I if I want to. If you want to, yeah. So again, there's some stress that comes along with that, but yeah. there's also some yeah. awesome, you know, it's it's yeah. a, a technology is amazing. Yeah. So again, I think it's you it's a give and take of with everything yeah. and you you're getting you're getting a lot of bad, but you're also getting a lot of good out For of sure. it. For sure.
too. So I guess it's just up to the individual. Yeah. And the wisdom it's your perspective. Because I, I you know for and we talk about it quite a bit is we we're really lucky to live in the communities that we live in and right. there's great people. Mm-hmm. But all of the nonsense that I hear everywhere else has a has tainted my view of just people in general. And yeah. there's there's an innate distrust that is building inside of me just for people. And the people that I'm around mostly are awesome. Yeah. And they're being judged because of all of the information that I'm, and I'm not saying I judge, but kind of, right? Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a layer of judgment across just that everybody's is falls under because of all the trash that you hear all all over. Welcome to team introvert, right? (sighs) No. We're glad to have you. (laughs) It's kind of nice in here. (laughs) Uh, Sorry, I know not to go down this rabbit hole, but you, when I first met you five years ago, We always joke, you're the mayor of this this yeah. part of town, yeah. right? You know everybody, you rub yeah. elbows with everybody, you're volunteering for everything. Uh-huh. Has that changed for you over the last the course yeah. of the last five years? Yeah, it has. Yeah, definitely. Has. I feel it has, but I didn't know if, if you that. felt that. No, 100%. Yeah. And it's funny, and and I don't know if it was a pandemic deal. I, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure, but my preference is to stay at home now. And hmm. I used to like, if we if we didn't go out and hang out with people, like, in five days, I'm like antsy, like to get out and go, like be with people. That's so strange because that's that's how I think of you still as yeah. the guy that you're, y'all are going to be out at events. You're going to be out. We doing are, stuff, and you we still are. do. We yeah, we are still. You still do way more than I do. <laughs> but but it's honestly like my wife plans most of it now. Mm. Whereas before it was like I was the event coordinator. It was like let's let's do something. Is that let's due go. to people just you're jaded? I think on honestly, people? man. Uh, yeah, and and it's not a good characteristic at all. Like, I don't, I don't think that it's great now. I also do think that I've shifted priorities because I was very, very much a people pleaser and I wanted to like make them happy, make them happy. Mm -hmm. And I've kind of just like said, okay, hold on. Where are my priorities? Because, you know, I I think my, my marriage was not nearly as strong as it could be. Um, And, you know, parenting, like I didn't spend enough time with my kids because it was like, we were at this and we're that and this and this over, I mean, all through playing, um, it was just we had we had events every weekend. We were doing something. It's like you know what? Like my kids are at an age where like I literally sat. We sw- I swam. It was me and my four kids. We swam on s- uh, Sunday for like seven hours. Mm. Like I never would have done that yeah. in the past. It was like no. oh we got we got to get into a softball tournament. Or we got to do this. We got to so. I don't know exactly what the reasoning for sounds the shift like a, is. Sounds like it's, nuance. It's nuance. Sounds like a lot of yeah. things. <laughs> yeah. Plus, Not, I, just, I just don't like people anymore. Well, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome for rubbing off on you. You did. You 100% <laughs> did. If you like people, just come hang out with me, and you won't very much longer. <laughs> uh, and then the third point in this section, kind of going back to the first point, uh, perspective taking doesn't work. Hmm. Are you interested? Are you intrigued? In polarized discussions, a common piece of advice is to take the other side's perspective. In theory, putting ourselves in another person's shoes enables us to walk lockstep with them. In practice, though, it's not that simple. Perspective taking consistently fails because we're terrible mind readers. We're just guessing. The greater the distance between us and and an adversary, the more likely we are to oversimplify their actual motives and invent explanations that stray from their reality. What works is not perspective taking, but perspective seeking. Actually talking to people to gain insight into the nuances of their views. That's what good scientists do. Instead of drawing conclusions about people based on minimal clues, they test their hypothesis by striking up conversations. So this whole chapter is just about (laughs) just pissing on just pissing on everything that I opened up with. (laughs) And, And he's not yeah, he's not saying again, it's kind of misleading. Yeah. It's more about don't just sit down and assume yeah. you know what a pro life per, or a pro choice person's perspective yeah. is. Yeah. Not just assuming you know that. Yeah. Actually talk to somebody who's pro yeah. choice. Yeah. And see what they're thinking. See where their their boundaries are. See what the lines are. That's his point. Yeah. It's not just thinking, well, they think this because they're pro choice. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have an argument. Don't, <laughs> just gonna don't expand on that. <laughs> no, no. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna leave it and uh, okay. yeah. All right, we'll let y'all think that one through. We're not gonna give you our. Opinion I do get one. I do get it though. I do get because oh, I'm looking at your perspective through my lens. Mm-hmm. So I, I haven't I don't look at the world the same as you. Yeah. Because I had a different life, and that's not good or bad. It's it's just different. 
And so trying to say, oh, you know what? I'm going to walk in their shoes and I'm going to, it makes sense. Um, we're going to edit out the beginning of the show on my opening, right? Just so I don't you've rethought. Like like, I don't with look like a, a total ass. This is real time rethinking yeah, your, so, your yeah. perspective. You know what? I'm going to walk through the shoes of this this author. You know, he's a professor, so I'm just kidding. He's I'm learned. He's he's way smarter than me. And no, but it does make sense. Like how when you ask and have a conversation, how often is the answer different than what you expect it to be? Like if you're asking somebody like, you know, hard questions, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like when they respond, I, there's a few times where I'm like, that's exactly what I thought you were going to say. Yeah. There's a few times. Usually there's, but at least you sought to yeah. confirm or deny. Right. That asking those questions. But the challenge is the challenge is, is asking the hard questions and starting those hard yeah. conversations. The other challenge is again, like we opened up with how many of these people are you actually going to have a conversation with? How many are you actually going to in, have in-person interaction with? Not many. Again, the people that think this way usually see it online. Yeah. And and the other side, you usually yeah. see them online. You usually don't see them in real life because they're not hanging out at the same place as you are. They're not yeah. the same sort of group of friends that you have, um, which is, again, why it's so imperative to seek out these opportunities to yeah. expand your perspective. Uh, shifting gears just a little bit, but um, education. Yeah. Would you say in 2023 our current education system – meets the demands of current times no 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 okay no and, and there's a number of things i've got and i and, and, and love our kids school but i do not think that it meets the demands i think that we have adjusted and um and conceded to an education system that makes it easier on kids gets them enough but it doesn't shape our kids into resilient creative productive self-thinking individuals totally agree we talked about this a few weeks back the the cynical conspiracy theorist says that our education system isn't evolving and changing because they it's easier to control yeah. dumb people yeah <laughs> so that's one side of it Another side of it is it's it's much easier just to stick with the status quo. What's yeah. always worked, yeah. let's just stick with it. But I, I'm in total agreement with you. In modern times, we're not teaching our kids true life skills, mm -hmm. street smarts, mm -hmm. we used to call it. Things that they can apply to their everyday life that will help them be contributing members of society. Our education yeah. system doesn't seem to have... Now there's some you can find some examples that are, but in yeah, general, yeah, they're out there. Right, there's education platforms, whether it's you know homeschool curriculum or you know private schools or you know some public school systems. I mean, okay. some of them are doing a great job, but I mean, just just an example. I was a watchdog, which is like the dads will come and they'll you know spend the day at the school and they'll like help out and whatever and. You know, my kids have been asking me for years to do it. And I finally was like, all right, this is my daughter's literally last month of school. I should probably do it while she's still there. And so, you know, teachers are amazing. They're great people. But one, teachers are handcuffed on what they can do uh, and what they can teach, right? They're told, okay, here's, here's what you can do. Here's how you teach it. And so in elementary school, at least in our district, there's zero homework. Zero. At any age? Zero. In elementary school. Elementary school. Zero. Really? Yeah. So there's not, hey, you've got a reading plan. There's not, hey, you've got your times tables. There's not book reports. There's not zero. Whatever they do, they do in class. What's the theory behind that? I have no idea. Hmm. No idea. I, I'm not sure. There's probably something, but like, hey, we want you to plug in and we want you to be focused here. Okay, great. Well, then let's hammer out the information while we're at school. And I right. get like, you've got to understand like attention spans and productivity. And there's, there's a lot of science behind it. Um, but if you're not going to have them, what is that teaching them that they've got to delay gratification slash snacks slash playtime slash watch TV, whatever you're doing at home. And I've got to get this done. I've got to get through my homework so that I can turn it in so that I can continue earning a good grade. Mm -hmm. No, it's like when you're off, you're off. Nothing to think about. And so I don't think that we are preparing our kids and teaching them good habits and life lessons because I right now when my kids are in star testing. Star testing is paramount to funding. So for three weeks, they have one test a week. The days that they're not testing, 
they're either preparing for the test or watching movies mm -hmm. because they've got to get mentally ready for their star test. You just wasted three weeks, three weeks of school. You're just teaching them how to pass a test. Pass a test. And it's like, it, it, it yeah. And, and the pressure that they put on the kids for the test, right. which has zero carryover to anything that they're going to do in life other yeah. than handle it a little bit of pressure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There, I guess you could argue there's a little bit of benefit there, but no, think but, about yeah. what other, what other ways could you apply pressure to them and help them learn through that homework, homework, other tests? Yes. I don't even know if, I mean, they have burpees. Tests. You ever, you ever try to think through burpees? No, see, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> why don't you add some physical activity sure. and then make them think while doing it? That's yes. why the kid strong um, concept is so great. Right. Is because they're mentally challenging kids while making them do physical activity. And that's real life. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I, I am constantly building spreadsheets while having to run away <laughs> from from rabid dogs. That's a real thing. <laughs> that's, yes, it absolutely is. <laughs> I agree. Another outdated concept is lectures. Would you agree? Lecturing, um, a teacher standing up there for an hour and just talking to the kids. Uh, okay, let me know. read this and you see if you agree yeah. or disagree. It's not so, it's not hard to see why a boring lecture would fail, but even captivating lectures can fall short for less obvious, more concerning reason. Lectures aren't designed to accommodate dialogue or disagreement. They turn students into passive receivers of information rather than active thinkers. In North American universities, more than half of STEM professors spend at least 80% of their time lecturing, just over a quarter in corporate bits of inactivity, and fewer than a fifth use truly student-centered methods that involve active learning. In high schools, it seems that half of teachers lecture most of the time. If you spend all of your school years being fed information and are never given the opportunity to question it, you won't develop the tool for rethinking that you need in life. Yes. Agree, disagree? Yeah. Nuance? Uh, nuance. Okay. Nuance. Because I, I do think that there's, you can add dialogue and and color and explanation to a particular topic. And that's where lecture, like same thing as, it's like saying sermons don't work. Like, well, yes and no. I, I do agree. It's, it's a lot of like in one ear. Okay, cool. And then you don't, and then you lose it. So, I think the active learning styles is important, but I do think lectures are uh, pr can be productive yeah. if done the correct way. So, okay, hey, here's uh, here's an exercise. We're gonna we're gonna run through it. We're gonna practice it. We're gonna lecture because I'm gonna add context to that exercise, and then we're gonna redo it mm -hmm. or have conversation, whatever the dialogue is. Um, you know, one thing we do on uh, one of the boards that we're on is we will present. Okay, mission, here's what we're going. And then it's somewhat of a lecture. And then we break out and then we get in small groups and we try to solve problems. And then we'll come back and then we'll lecture, talk about summary, what we all came up with, dialogue, challenge it, why it's going to work, why it's not going to work. And then we go to the next topic, lecture, mm -hmm. problem solve, com conversation. And that's, and that's, I've seen more get done through that process. But so you're actively participating. But that's active. Uh, to, but me, I don't think, to me, he's defining lectures as that's it. teacher sits up there, talks for an hour. There's no dialogue. They just get through their thing and then yeah. release the Agreed. Because the what happens, right? You, you remember college. You, you lecture. Okay, great. Awesome. I've got notes. But I've, so just, I've got to go retake notes out yeah. of the textbook anyways because that's what the test is going to be on. I've actually thought about the way you, you – described just now why church more churches don't do that do it that way uh -huh. you know church is very old school pastor uh -huh. gets up there for his 30 uh -huh. minutes talks i can't even tell you what the, the and this is this is my fault but mm -hmm. i can't even tell you what the sermon was on yesterday at church like i, I just that's to me that's not how i receive information yeah. i need to be active i yeah. need to be engaged yeah and so i've always thought about why don't churches do that more where they yeah. talk for 10 minutes and part of it is People don't want to show up to church and think. <laughs> we just want to think, show up and think or, or be transparent <laughs> right, and vulnerable, right? right? Like right. because if you're actually having conversations and you're sharing, okay, hey, that point that he just brought up, mm -hmm. um, you know, I struggle with that or yeah. hey, the transparency because they're strangers. But that's that's the setting of small groups. That's why like college classrooms shouldn't be 200 people where it's a lecture and there's there can't be dialogue right. and you're almost criticized for raising questions because it's like, Hey, we've only got so much time. Like who are you to disrupt everybody else? Right. And that's why I think classrooms, it needs to be more of the smaller size, like 12 to 15 people mm -hmm. where, okay, you got a couple groups, 
lecture, talk, work it out, and it's more interactive. Yeah, the university I went to is a small university, but all of our classes were that way. In fact, I can name maybe one or two were a class of over 100. Oh, every, really? Every class was that 20. Huh. It, was, it was very much like high school. It was just yeah. an advanced version of high school is huh. what it was, which, again, it wasn't the most world's class education, probably not, but – the bright side was the Harvard of, of West Texas. <laughs> That's right. So. The bright side was the professor knew my name. Yeah. They had, we had a relationship. They cared about me as long as I showed that effort. Yep. So it was very much more intimate. Yeah. And again, I think that's what he's referring to is these lectures. There's yeah, a time and place. Yeah. But have an open discussion open because that's what work is, right? We'll have meetings where we're getting lectured, but a lot of it's interactive collaboration, yeah. work together. How do we solve this problem? Uh huh. Why can't we teach our high schoolers that yeah. form? of math, economics, science, whatever subject matter, art, yeah. whatever subject matter we're in. Yeah, I agree. And it's yeah. just easier, right? It's default. As a teacher, it's much easier to sit there and I, I can just give my points out. And is it though? If you like, figure out, is then, it, then I mean, is it, is, I mean, is it easier to prepare a 30-minute lecture or is it easier to come up with six different I don't points know. to yeah. quickly discuss and then let dialogue happen. For me, it's easier that way because yeah. that's how my brain works. Yeah. For some, I guess, maybe it's different. Again, yeah. it's, it's a spectrum. Not everything. I guess we're all receiving information yeah. differently. Um, new ways of thinking in our education system. It says, I believe that good teachers introduce new thoughts, but great teachers introduce new ways of thinking. Collecting a teacher's knowledge may help us solve the challenges of the day, but understanding how a teacher thinks can help us navigate the challenges of a lifetime. Ultimately, education is more than the information we accumulate in our heads. It's habits we develop as we keep revising our drafts and the skills we build to keep learning. Yeah, so that's yeah I agree. That I agree. Uh, and then lastly, escaping tunnel vision in our career paths. Again, the statistics are crazy right now. I was listening to uh, a podcast yesterday. We were just talking about how many men, 25 to 45, are just – not even trying to seek work right now. It's in the millions of men who are just sitting at home. That's insane. No purpose, no sense of direction, Gosh, that's insane. no guidance, right? They're just not even looking at it. Yeah. And I mean, obviously there's a wide spectrum of reasons for that, yeah. but just that sense of purpose and work is good for you. Yeah. I maybe not always thought that, but I'm coming around to the idea of I need something. I need something to strive for. Even if it's a job that yeah. I don't like, it's still good for me. Yeah to go through that experience. Yep. Uh, and so he opens this, he says, rethinking the plan. When we dedicate ourselves to a plan that isn't going as we hoped, our first instinct isn't usually to rethink it. Instead, we tend to double down and sink more resources into the plan. This pattern is called escalation of commitment. Escalation of commitment is a major factor in preventable failures. Ironically, it can be fueled by one of the most celebrated engines of success, grit. When it comes to rethinking, though, grit may have a dark side. There's a fine line between heroic persistence and foolish stubbornness. Sometimes the best kind of grit is gritting our teeth and turning around. This part punched me in the I forehead. I was just going to say, <laughs> you've talked about this. When do you know when? When do you know when it's time to pivot? Yeah. Because, again, the the and I spent so much of my time as a mental vagina that it, I had no grit. Vagine. I had no grit. And... Yeah. So now I overcompensate by I'm going to be the grittiest person you know. Yeah. I'm going to get after it. I'm not going to quit for anything. Yep. And so I think I've just like I do a lot of things. The pendulum has swung so far. Yeah. There is a time when you've got to realize it's better for me to rethink what I'm thinking here and maybe pivot. Yeah. The question is, and there's no right answer, is yeah. when do you come to that moment? Yeah. When, does the, when does the situation call for grit and call for pushing through and you just haven't given enough time yet? And when does it call for, hey, what you're doing sucks. Yeah. It's not working. It's never going to work. Yeah. Maybe try a different method. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, man, there, there, there's, we could do a whole episode, I think, on this because there's, there's so many layers as it pertains to your career. Um, I think one thing, one thing that has helped me over the last 18 months is, that I don't look at my career as um, as like finite deals. Okay, hey, this is this is the rest of my life. This is what I'm gonna do. Um, you know, I gotta pick it and I gotta be right. Mm -hmm. uh, I am looking at it as look. This is this is a journey that I am on. I am on a journey for the rest of my life, and 
every single phase that I am in is an education for the next phase whenever that starts. Mm -hmm. And I don't know when it's going to start. And I have to, and I've learned to almost be okay with that. And it's actually helped me be more present in this current career. And then it's also helped me say, because my problem, and, and you know this, my problem in this is I say yes to so much stuff that it would bury me saying yes to things because I was like, this is it, this is it. I got to make everything that I can. I got to make it all that I can right now and I got to maximize it. So I'm saying yes to things that ultimately hurt my progress because I was trying to like get that and get that and get this and get this and get that. Whereas now I'm looking at it like, look, I am, I am in a full-blown education for what my next phase and whenever that is. And I think it's one of those things – you may or may not recognize when there's a transition from phase one to phase two or phase two to phase three, or phase three to phase four. You may or may not recognize un unless you look back. Yeah. Like, oh, that, that was the pivot. Um, I think what we do is we put so much grandness on these transition periods, and, and, and rightfully so. And for me, I'm like you. I analyze, 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 and I don't want to, like, ever like pull the trigger to like make that make that transition but it's like look i'm just learning and soaking in everything that i can along the way um and i'll never stop learning and i'll never stop growing and i'll never stop changing yeah. and wherever my career goes it goes um i just when i'm there i just need to look at it like not only am i producing income for my family but man i'm just gaining more and more wisdom and experience in this field that's going to help me two, three, yeah. four years from now. Yeah. When it comes to grit, it's been glorified yeah. and there's enough examples like you, you're a great example of grit in your NFL career. Meaning it was probably silly to think in your early years that this was yeah. going to work out for you. But if yeah. you didn't have that grit and that somewhat ignorance, yeah. you wouldn't have pushed through and saw through to your goal. Yeah. So there's an example like that where common sense would say, Hey, I've been at this for two or three years. It's not really working for me. Yeah. Maybe I should pivot and go do something else. I'm, you know, yeah. maybe, maybe you're not the best, but, but you get what no, I'm trying but, to no, say. No, 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 is, but I, is, I think that's an example that people are like, Oh, well that's different. Well, not really. Yeah. Like if you, if, if you talk to anybody in their forties or fifties that you'd say, okay, Hey dude, they, they are successful. If you look back in their 20s, they probably went through a very similar experience, whatever it was, starting a company, new job, moving, you know, whatever it may be. And like, dude, you should quit that. Like, yeah. don't keep doing that. Like that, there's no chance that you're ever going to be a CEO. There's no chance you're ever going to own a business. There's no chance. And I would say it's similar. The stage that I pursued was just, just had more tension. Yeah. So it's like, oh, yeah, that's... Yeah, super gritty. And I but I, I I don't disagree with you because there was times I almost did. I mean, if my wife didn't talk me into like give it another shot, I would have mm -hmm. quit. Yeah. I would have. Yeah. Um but same thing is I just as opposed to like ah, grind it out, grind it out, grind it out, grind it out. Maybe there's that diamond on the other side of that one rock that I just mm -hmm. gotta I gotta hammer it out and I'll get there. Don't don't aim for that one diamond ever. Like aim for the other side of the mountain, dig yourself out on the other side of the mountain and whatever you collect al along the way, you collect along the way. Yeah. Yeah. I've definitely shifted my thinking over the last several years of being less tied to the end result yeah. and being more tied to the process yes. of getting there. Yeah. And the details are probably going to look different than what I had imagined in yeah. my head and not being so tied to that has to work out this specific yes. way. Yep. That's how I used to think very yep. much was the specific plan has to go according to this yeah. or else it's a failure or yeah. whatever. Now it's being less tied to that, and that's freed me up for other opportunities. Yeah. So today, I'm currently doing what we do, but I'm open to the idea that three years from now, maybe it's something completely different, yeah. and I'm okay with that. Yeah. If that's what so happens to come along. That's right. Whereas the old me would have said, no, I have to be yeah. you know, the top broker in all of Dallas-Fort Worth, and it has to go this way, and each step has to be perfect. And that's just not how I think anymore. Uh, another example is, and I won't say the name uh, of the company, hopefully we can have them on one day, but the guy that you and I just helped. Yeah. And f seven, eight years ago, people thought he was crazy. Yeah. And like, what are you doing? Yeah. And now he's a multi-million dollar you know, company. Yeah. When I guarantee you, there were times when everybody in his circle was telling him this is dumb. So grit in that instance yeah. 
help them out. Yeah. It's knowing though, when does grit hurt you? When yeah. is it a detriment to yeah, what you're I doing? Think, I think there's got to be a parallel between conviction and purpose, right? There's got to be a parallel. Like, in, in, in how much grit you uh, you use in a certain scenario it has to do with your conviction yeah. and purpose. Yeah. And, and if you don't know what those are, then again, that's where – staying with something becomes very hard mm -hmm. because you just, you don't know what you're trying to do. You're literally just there punching the clock. There's no, if you don't have conviction and purpose on what your mission is and what your purpose is, then it's really hard to yeah. be gritty about something. Uh, had this topic a few weeks ago. Young people listen to this. When to know to leave your current job. Deciding to leave a current career path is often easier than identifying a new one. A first step is to entertain possible selves. Identify some people you admire within or outside your field and observe what they actually do work day by day. Do at work day by day. A second step is develop a hypothesis about how these paths might align with your interests, skills, and values. A third step is to test out the different identities by running experiments. Do informational interviews, job shadowing, and sample projects to get a taste of the work. The goal is not to confirm a particular plan, but to expand your repertoire of possible selves, which keeps you open yeah. to rethinking. I yeah. actually did this unknowingly when I was in the fitness industry. I started interning at the company that we both work for now on my day off. So I didn't, oh, I didn't just, know you did that. Yeah. Well, that was the, that was the plan. And then like two weeks in, they're like, Hey, why don't you come work full time? Yeah, yeah, you're Cause right. I just crushed it. Cause I'm amazing. But <laughs> <laughs> the plan was show up on my off day, which happened to be Friday in this yeah. scenario. And just hang out with us all day. See what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Is yeah. this something that you gravitate towards? Is this yeah. something you could be interested in? Yeah. And uh, now, obviously, you have to have good relationships and, yeah. and opportunities to do that. But yeah. for me, it was perfect because I wasn't just willy-nilly quitting my job. Yeah. It was allowing me to expose myself to something completely different. Totally. Which allowed me to explore that opportunity. Yeah. And was, again, I didn't think it through this intellectually at the time. But the process was still the same, which yeah. is I have my current field. I'm thinking about leaving, uh -huh. but I'm not sure I want to make the jump just yet. Let me go sample this out. Yeah. So volunteer, I don't know of any, and correct me if I'm wrong, if you're a business owner out there, I, I don't think there's any business owners out there that reject free labor, good work. Yeah. Obviously, if you're a piece of shit, they don't want you around. Yeah. But if you're going to show up and give them free, valuable work, yep. I don't know any boss that's going to, or any business owner that's going to turn that down. No, it no. just takes a little bit of, you know, discomfort on your part yeah. and, you know, the time and effort to put something in something that you're not going to see an immediate return. But yeah. to me, it's worth it. It was worth it because it allowed me into a career that I never thought I would have yeah. before. That's right. Yeah. I, it, and this could save years of setbacks. Yeah. Because when someone's recruiting you and anytime like I interview someone or I meet with someone about, well, oh, I want to get into real estate. I want to do this. Um, I'm honest. Like I'm very honest, like almost to the point where it's like, Hey, he's super negative and it's, it's not, but you need to understand because so many people want to tell you about that deal. Like I was literally had a conversation last night with a guy and some guy was like recruiting him into a certain career. And he gave an example. Well, see, I, I just did this deal and here's what it was. And I literally am making seven figures on it. And I asked the guy, I was like, well, how long had you been in the business? He's like, oh, 25 years. I was like, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. and you, and you, you paint this picture of like, oh, it's easy and you do this and it's, it, you know, you make so much money or you do this and they tell you all that stuff. And then you get there and it's like, oh my gosh, like this mountain I have to climb is so much bigger than I ever expected. That, that was me. The picture, yeah. the picture was painted to me that yes. I was going to walk in day one and make all this money crush and it. do all this stuff and crush it. Yeah. And look, at, a, look, <laughs> at, look at John over there, yeah. man. He's making a million dollars this year. You could be right there. Just put it's in the right work. There. It's yeah. like, yeah, but for how long? Right. Now, yeah. luckily I got there faster than I thought I would. So it, it yeah. all worked out. But to your point, but there was, there was, paint the real I'm picture sure, for me. I'm sure years plural where you're like what the hell what did i do oh absolutely yeah yeah my wife and, taught me into i wouldn't be here yeah doing what we're doing yeah if it hadn't been for my wife two years ago i if, still remember the conversation if <laughs> right right two if, years ago if it had been not that long ago if someone had told you exactly what it was and honestly in in because i did that i interviewed 
I interviewed other companies. Like and I say that sounds super like humble, right? But I was like, all right, I'm going to go meet with you. I'm going to go meet with you. I'm going to go meet with you. I'm not asking for a job. Like, I want to just know about your company. Yeah. I want to know what you do, how the story behind it. Like, I want to understand all this. And, uh, and I was told like, it's going to take you three to four years before you like start to get it. And, and I heard it and I was like, nah, mm. not me. Like I just retired from the Cowboys. Like it's not going to take me that long. Like I I'll be fine. Give me a year. Yeah. I'll be good. In my first year, I ended up having a good year because I like had a relationship that I stumbled through a bunch of a bunch of projects with, mm -hmm. and then it was like, oh crap! Now I gotta start over, and I gotta actually like do this the right way. Okay, here yeah. we go. Now it's a grind. But if if I knew the grittiness that it was gonna take to get to it, and I had like a realistic, and I and I had people like walking alongside me, it's like okay. If I have, if I can see the finish line, I'll get there. Doesn't matter. Like I'll push through it. Mm -hmm. But it's it's a lot of times when people make a transition because they hear all the good stuff about it, then they get in it and they're like, I don't see the finish line. Yeah. I don't know how I don't know how I'm gonna get there. That's when they quit yeah. and they just waste time. Yeah, my brother's a good example of doing it the right way. When he first got out of school, he knew he wanted to build houses, and that's like, what this is doing. a great example. Yes. And so what he did to introduce himself to each of the trades is he would go work at each trade for a few months to get familiar with what they do. So he'd go work for a plumber for six months. He'd go work for a drywall guy for six months. He'd go. So he did every single aspect. Now for his motivation and goal was, I just want to know what everybody's doing. Yeah. But if he was just switch his mindset for a second, if he wasn't sure, is yeah. this something I want to do? Let me go sample it, see which trade I gravitate towards most. Yeah and then make my decision from there. So I thought that was, a, and he made, you know, hourly rate. It, it yeah. wasn't like he was crushing, you know, he yeah. took a, sh he took a haircut financially. He was a college grad yeah. making minimum wage because he knew the ultimate goal yeah. was to get to where he wanted to go. And the way he did that was by sampling and yeah. seeing which job fit his interests and fit his skill set yeah. best. That's good. And I thought that was a great way to do that. The That's way good. you did it, getting out of school or getting out of the, the league and going and interviewing different, yeah. you know, different sectors, different businesses. Yeah. So again, I think the point is the takeaway point there. If you're young and you're wanting to leave your job, it's not just taking the leap and yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know who's no, who's going to give me the best salary, right? No who foresight the, whatsoever. Who has yeah? Who has the coolest office? Yeah. There's people in your sphere, in your sec, in your in your circle of of relationships that are willing to help you out. That's right. And, and you just got to find those people that are willing to. Now I know we're all busy. I get it, but there's people that are willing to talk you through it. Yep. So that's that, that was some good advice there. Uh, wrapping it up here, a couple more points. The pursuit of happiness. This is an interesting little segment. Kid Cudi song. That's right. If we're not careful, the pursuit of happiness can become a recipe for misery. Psychologists find that the more people value happiness, the less happy they often become with their lives. There's even evidence that placing a great deal of importance on happiness is a risk factor for depression. Why? One possibility is that when we're searching for happiness, we get too busy evaluating life to actually experience it. Yep. Instead of savoring our moments of joy, we ruminate about why our lives aren't more joyful. A second likely culprit is that we spend too much time striving for peak happiness, overlooking the fact that happiness depends more on the frequency of positive emotions than their intensity. A third potential factor is that when we hunt for happiness, we overemphasize pleasure at the expense of purpose. This theory is consistent with data suggesting that meaning is healthier than happiness and that people who look for purpose in their work are more successful in pursuing their passions and less likely to quit their jobs than those who look for joy. A fourth explanation is that Western conceptions of happiness as an individual state leave us feeling lonely. In more collective and more, co well, sorry, in more collectivist Eastern cultures, that pattern is reversed. Pursuing happiness predicts higher well-being because people prioritize social engagement over independent activities. Yeah. I thought the first one that was, says... That was a great section. Instead of savoring our moments of joy, we ruminate about why our lives aren't more joyful. Yeah. I'm such a guilty bastard yeah. on that point right there. Yeah. We're out there uh, yesterday with me and my boys. My, well, I've talked about it a million times. My oldest son's into sports, all thing, ball, everything. You know, If it bounces, he's into it. Yeah. Second son... Trucks is his thing. Yeah. Cars, trucks, different like that. So yesterday we went to uh, this deal here in DFW. It was like touch a truck is what it's called. And there oh, were a yeah. bunch of it was like fire trucks and is police it cars. Or it was in the colony. Oh, yeah, Salina really does cool. one. Salina yeah. does one. Yes, yeah, yeah, I think we're going to go to that one too. Yeah. But 
just in that moment, because we do a lot of stuff for my older son. Yeah. Like everything yeah. revolves around him and his sports and his activities. But to see my three-year-old and the yeah. joy on his face in that moment, just getting to freaking see. Now, I could have been sitting there thinking about all the things I got to do. It's Sunday, yeah. right? It's time to relax. I don't want to go. Yeah. I could have been thinking about all these things instead yeah. of just enjoying that moment and so that was really really cool and a cool reminder of that's great just man. slowing things down yeah. seeing it through a three-year-old's eye i mean he was so stoked dude for the and it was so much for fun the garbage truck yes i get yeah. to honk the horn <laughs> of the garbage truck yes yes he was like running from truck to i mean it was oh, the coolest yeah. experience yeah and it was that's just such awesome. a small like and as far as significance goes it wasn't that crazy of, a, of an event uh -huh. but for him it was just that joy of that moment man that's it awesome. was so cool and that that's so awesome. if i can start appreciating those days instead of looking for the peak happiness yes. all the time yeah you know that well that didn't take that much effort to yeah. find that joy yesterday yeah it was awesome yep loving the process um that's right and then uh the pursuit of meaning when it comes to careers instead of searching for the job where we'll be happiest we might be better off pursuing the job where we can expect to learn and contribute the most. Psychologists find that passions are often developed, not discovered. Interest doesn't always lead to effort and skill. Sometimes it follows them. By investing in learning and problem solving, we can develop our passions and build the skills necessary to do the work and lead the lives we find worthwhile. As we get older, we become more focused on searching for meaning and we're mo most likely to find it in actions that benefit others. Yeah. So we'll talk about that all the time. This is huge right here because I love, like, love, love our company. And I would recommend it to anybody that asks. Like, our leadership is amazing. Coworkers are amazing. Like, our company is awesome. However, <laughs> when you question your meaning and, like, why am I doing this? What impact am I making? it feels it still feels different mm -hmm. it feels like all right what it, what purpose is it like yes i'm helping people and i love that and i'm doing this but like what is the meaning like really behind it and and that's something that i've struggled with there's times i'm like okay i get it like here's here's but like i could this is my calling mm -hmm. for sure like i could totally see it. and then there's other times i'm like I, and I'm not sure, like, it doesn't matter how fun our office is, how cool the people are, how much like they pour into us. Like all those things are great. If you don't align meaning with it, it, it becomes a, a fleeting, um, it, it becomes a fleeting, just like job. And it's like, all right, okay, now it's a job. And so it's, it's, I have a hard time. And, and also when you, when you finish like serving others is, I keep saying like I'll work from home two to three days a week and I like it because I get a lot done, mm -hmm. but there's absence of meaning me sitting in front of my computer for 12 right. hours. Right. You know, mm -hmm. and it's like, and I'm not actually having conversations, encouraging people or getting encouraged, whatever it may be. It's very different when I'm at home for a week, just my mentality and like my passion for my job, my day job is very different mm -hmm. when I'm at home because I'm not I'm not helping other people. Right. That's yeah. totally different. Yeah. Yeah, I won't rehash because we've said it a bunch lately, but just this is the process that I've been in the yeah. last few years. You know, I was ready to move on to something else two years ago. Mm -hmm. I started with the help of my wife, reevaluating what's important to me, the aspects of the job that I do enjoy. And now I've really put focus on those things and mm -hmm. I haven't looked back since. Yeah. And it's been a complete shift in my mentality yeah. in my approach to the day to day. Yeah. And that's made all the difference in the world for me. So instead of thinking, is this job my passion? Do I really love what I do? It's, I love relationships. I love being part of a team. Yep. I love, you know, being able to provide for my family. I love having a flexible schedule. Yep. So I've started to emphasize those things that I do love about it. Yeah. And that's all I think about. Yeah. The negative thoughts have totally, not totally disappeared, but mostly disappeared. And yeah. it's been a completely different experience. Yep. And, you know, again, not that it always works this way, but productivity has gone up right results have come better because of the mentality shift mm -hmm. um so anyway yeah i won't rehash it too much but that's what that's what i, what I was reminded of when i read it's that good. section it's good and then in conclusion um to wrap up the book here again said this from the beginning pick up this book yourself it's called think again by adam grant there's so many nuggets of gold in here we barely scratched the surface 
Um, and again, you maybe you have different takeaways than, than what we've talked about. But to, to wrap this up from the book, he says, Our identities are open systems, and so are our lives. We don't have to stay tethered, tethered to old images of where we want to go or who we want to be. The simplest way to start rethinking our opinions is to question what we do daily. It takes humility to reconsider our past commitments, doubt to question our present decisions, and curiosity to reimagine our future plans. Rethinking liberates us to do more than update our knowledge and opinions. It's a tool for leading a more fulfilling life. Mm, that's good. So It's good, man. Well any done. Any closing thoughts, ideas? No, I think this is impactful. Again, <clears throat> just thinking about how you think is it's important. And using a lot of these uh, these ideas and concepts, and I, and I love just the ideas like, hey, look, we're not – uh, we're not a preacher. We're not a politician. Uh, what was the other one? Professor. Professor. Like, be a scientist. Like, poke holes in your own thoughts. Like, challenge it. Come up with a question. Test it. Come up with a new question. Yep. Test it. Yep. Um, because there's so much to learn out there. And anybody that thinks that they know it all, you know nothing. <laughs> You need to rethink that. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> you need to think again. I heard somewhere. Wow, <laughs> this is your one shot in life to think again, <laughs> right now. Well, appreciate it, guys. Hopefully, yeah. y'all enjoyed that series. I know I did, but and that's really all that matters. If I enjoyed it, so. Um, but hopefully, you guys did as well. <laughs> uh, excited for next week. We're gonna Let's open go. up a new series on preparedness. Come on, uh, something that I'm horrible at, yeah. and that I need to do a better job of. Yeah. And, What's really cool about this series, we've already actually uh, recorded a couple of them. We're actually bringing in outside, outsiders, experts. outside experts. So it's not just so it's not, yeah. two meatheads telling you. <laughs> Get that knife. Yes, save, <laughs> save your steaks. <laughs> Get a deep freezer. Oh, that's right. We're actually talking to experts in their fields, yep. learning from them. How can we be prepared? Because, again, the idea behind this whole uh, series is going to be how can we be better leaders for our families yep. and in our communities. Yep. It's not about becoming doomsday. It's not about save yourself. It's about how can you be yeah. an asset to your community That's and right. to your family. Uh, so really excited about that series. And again, that'll be next week. But uh, until then, we hope you guys have a great rest of your week, a great weekend, and we will see you next week.